Hi platform, my name is Anne Napolitano and I'm the author of the novel Dear Edward. And today we're gonna to talk about success, failure, and everything in between. Just wake me up, cause I don't wanna dream this dream. When I was 10 years old, my teacher gave all of us in class a vocabulary assignment, the standard one that you get where you have a list of words. And on this particular occasion, the teacher wanted us to connect, write them in sentences and to connect the sentences. And so I went home and did the assignment and I thought it took about five minutes. Um, so when I was done, I looked up and saw that it had been 45 minutes. And it blew my mind because it was the first thing outside of play that had made time disappear. And I thought, oh, this is the stuff. This is what I want to do. And the next day I started a novel about a wartime orphan. And I think I wrote about 15 pages. And then two months later, I started a book about a wartime nurse because I decided, obviously, at the age of 10 that I needed to be a serious novelist. And serious novelists clearly wrote about war, which I had no experience in. I would write short stories. I, would, uh, I kept a journal. I uh, started and dropped novels uh, basically all the way through the end of high school. But as I went into high school, I was very shy. And I stopped telling people that I was writing and I stopped showing people my work. So it became something that I did for myself. And I enjoyed essay writing in English literature class, but it was fiction writing that was my real secret passion. And so when I chose a university, I specifically chose a school that had a creative writing program um, so that I could take classes in fiction writing. But while I was there, I decided I was probably gonna go into a safer career, one that had benefits and a steady salary and that my parents would be happy with, and that I would continue to write on the side secretly. What happened was that I got sick when I was 20 with like a big virus, uh, which meant that I was uh, sick for like two years and I had no immune system, so I would catch every illness that came by. And I had only a limited amount of energy every day, so I had to decide what to do with that energy. And what I decided at the age of 20 was that the things that made me feel the best was writing So and my boyfriend. So <laughs> I, I focused on writing and my boyfriend. And doing that though made me realize A, that life could change on a dime, that I could wake up one day with a fever after having been healthy for my entire life basically and everything would be different. And of course I got better. I was sick for like two years. It took me an extra year to finish college. But essentially that changed my life and made me realize that I needed to make real choices about what I wanted to do. And I decided I didn't want to do what I thought I should do, which was get the safe job with the benefits, etc. I wanted to do what I really wanted to do, which was write fiction. And so that meant telling people, and it meant doing it for real. I went to graduate school for fiction writing, um, partly to make my parents happy, because it gave me a graduate degree. I wrote a novel, and it got rejected by 80 agents. And then I wrote another novel, and I got an agent, but it was rejected by all the publishers. So I put that one aside too. And it was my third novel that finally was published. And I think I was 30. So I decided when I was 10 that I wanted to be a writer, but I did not publish a word until I was 30 years old. After my second novel did not sell, so I had written two novels but published nothing, I was depressed and I was working as a personal assistant and my father was sending me brochures for law school and I thought, oh, I need to find something else to do. This isn't working out. The only thing that made me feel better, the only way I could climb out of being depressed was writing. So I started writing again just to stop feeling sad. And when that happened, it was a kind of revelation for me because I realized that this was part of who I was. And that even if I never published a word, I was gonna keep writing. And that took a huge weight lifted at that point because I realized it was part of me and part of my future. And even though I had failed with a big capital F, because I told everybody I wanted to be a writer and I had not succeeded, that that was kind of put aside and that writing now was going to be something that I did whether I succeeded or failed externally at all. If I could give advice to my earlier self, I was so shy and I didn't feel like I deserved to take up space and I didn't feel like my voice needed to be heard. I think if I had stopped worrying so much about how other people perceived me and whether I deserved to, to take up space and if I had understood that I do take up space and I might as well fill it with the most meaningful version of myself possible just for my own satisfaction, not for the satisfaction of the world around me, then I might have taken ownership for who I really was and who I wanted to be. When I was sick when I was 20, 
All my friends were partying and going to keggers and storing their beer in my fridge. I had an extra large fridge for my special diet because I was sick. I only had a limited amount of energy, so I was focusing my energy every day. And it, it made me sort of look at the terrain of being a 20-year-old and say no, yes, no, yes, no. So actually for things like partying, which never came naturally to me because I'm hugely introverted and I prefer a smaller group or talking one-on-one, -on -one, I sort of rejected that for all time. It made me live authentically, not just in choosing what I wanted to do with my life and owning that, but also in owning, in a way, I, I stopped pretending that I was fun or extroverted or going to be the life of the party. And there was freedom in that as well. So it, it being sick um, streamlined, necessarily streamlined everything that I was doing. And as I became healthy and returned to a fuller life, I kept that streamlined nature. And I never went back to pretending to be someone who I wasn't which was a real blessing. In high school in America, obviously, um, they have things called advanced placement classes that you test into, I guess, around when you take your A-levels. Um, so the last two years of high school, you get to take these sort of advanced classes in the fields that you're interested in. And I was not accepted for AP English literature because I didn't talk enough in class. And I was devastated. I remained pissed that they did that to me because it's so wrong. I wanted to be in there so badly because they were reading all these amazing novels and the teacher was amazing. And it felt really like foundationally upsetting to me that I couldn't get into that class. But in a way, I was just like, it reinforced for me that this is what I wanted and that that was wrong and that I was gonna write that somehow, even if that meant just going to university and taking English literature classes because they couldn't keep me out because I was too quiet in class. It is what everyone always says, it's paying attention to your inner compass and staying true to what you are interested in. And so much of writing is being alone in a room. And the more that you can focus on being alone in that room and make, writing sentences and making up stories and the sort of joy and pleasure and deep work that comes when you are alone in that room, you need to get to a place where that's your sustenance, not the teacher who gives you a B or a C instead of an A, or your friend who reads your story and thinks it's self-indulgent. Um, you're gonna get an entire range of reactions to every single thing that you write. And what you need to be able to listen to is, is your own voice saying, I'm proud of this. I finished it. I think it's as good as can be. I'm, I'm proud of this work um, and not listen to everybody else. I think that the first novel that I wrote when I was in graduate school is terrible. And I'm glad it never reached any kind of an audience. Um, I think often to learn how to write a book, it, writing a short story, you have a beginning, middle, and end. It's like swimming across a lake and we can see the other side of the lake, I can see how to get there, I know how to swim, I think I have the stamina. When you set out to write a book, which is maybe 350 pages, it's like swimming across the ocean, and there's no way to know how to swim across the ocean until you try to swim across the ocean. So, unless you're a genius, and there are geniuses, I am not one of them. I had to write a book in order to figure out how to write a book. So the first one was terrible, but I didn't know that then, I thought it was great. I didn't think it was great, I thought it was good. And I thought it had some really nice bits in it, um, which is not good enough. So then I wrote another book and that book is better. Um, it almost sold. After I published one book, I went back and reread it and it's good, but I had like left it behind emotionally and I could no longer, I, was, I couldn't get excited by the idea of putting it back out there in any way again, like I wasn't that person anymore. So in your creative life, part of the really interesting thing is that you're writing from where you are now, which is very different than who you were 10 years ago emotionally. You know, as far as your understanding of the world, what I would write now is very different uh, from what I would write when I was 25. And I've been writing for 20 whatever years, so I can write better sentences. So there is an evolution and basically that's it. My goal is to write a book I'm proud of and that for the next book, I want it to be better. Um, I don't, it, I don't care anything else as long as it's, it's. I consider it better, and I'm proud of it. Mm -hmm.